gentlemen, welcome back to Sober Sit Down. I'm your host, Scotty Stutch. With me today is um, a gentleman um, from uh, the previous life uh, and has a great inspirational story. Um, from originally from the New York area and now migrated down to the uh, South Midwest, I believe, uh, Mr. Robert Borelli. Well, you were that guy, that bad guy that we always hear about. You know, when we watch TV shows like The Sopranos or the movie The Godfather, where you were almost ruthless. And in your book you wrote, shooting your friend in the head because he thought he was stealing from you was normal. So what is it that brought you to that lifestyle? I remember just growing up as a kid and, and seeing like three kind of things that I, I could relate to. And one was my mom and dad who worked really hard for a living, but we really didn't have much. Uh, arguments over, you know, finances, because we didn't have enough money to feed all the kids or pay the rent sometimes. And I really didn't want to be that. And then we had the drunks and the drug addicts that were falling out in the street, and I didn't want to be them. But then we seen these guys in the neighborhood, they have social clubs, and we used to call them wise guys, and, and they seemed to have it all together. So at a young age, I kind of like, wanted to be like them, and that was the process of doing it. How you doing, Robert? Well, thank you. Do you go by Scotty or Scott? So it's where I don't... Um, <laughs> it's, I, I really like don't... That. I really don't have a personal preference. Uh, Scott's good, Scotty's good, whatever whatever rolls off, you know what I mean? I could call you Mr. Stutch. That's, that's fine, that's fine, that's a first. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, I thank you for the opportunity to allow me to share uh, my life and the transformation that God has made in my life. So uh, yeah. thank you for this opportunity. Appreciate it. Absolutely. So, um, you know, we'll start, you know, early years, uh, childhood. Um, I, you know, I, I, I know that you uh, grew up in the East New York area of uh, Brooklyn when you were, um, when you were a young kid. Yes, sir. So, you know, back in the day, um, you grew up in the like mid late fifties, uh, early sixties. Um, you know, that was, um, that area of town from my research, I'm, I, you know, I'm big with historical, um, historical facts about the life. Um, I have a lot of respect for the, the previous life and, you know, some of the old, old school, you know, gentlemen that conducted themselves in an organized crime fashion. Uh, so, I mean, I know in, you know, East New York area, um, you know, from what I've read, you know, you had, it was like growing up, there was like gangs and stuff. Um, you know, you had like the Gaudis, they were from like the Fulton Ave, Rockaway area. Um, you were um, growing up, uh, you linked up with, I think it was Ronnie One Arm and um, Fat Andy Ruggiano. So um, you, uh, your childhood, like how did you um, fall into, you know, hanging out with these guys and getting involved in the life and stuff? Well, this is it. As a kid, a lot of the shows that I watched back in the in the fifties, early sixties, a lot of gangster. You had Edward G. Robinson, Humphrey Bogart, James Caddy doing a lot of these gangster movies. You know, The Untouchables and stuff like that. I was always infatuated with that lifestyle. You know, it, it seemed to grasp me. You know, I always rooted for the bad guy to get away. You know. And it's a kind of weird today I root for the bad guy to get caught now, like I, I got caught. But anyway, but that's kind of it. But my the history of my neighborhood goes all the way back to, I mean, there was a, a, a movie made, uh, oh, oh uh, I can't think of the name right off the top of my head, but it'll come back to me, uh, Murder Incorporated. Um, that was one of the movies that, that those guys were affiliated with the East New York Bed Stuy area neighborhood. So my neighborhood was kind of like that. But then, you know, back in the 80s, I think they did a movie called The Warriors, you know, and that kind of depicted, I know it was, a lot of it was infatuated, it was infatuated, but it, you know, it wasn't all true. But it kind of gave you the idea of the neighborhood of where I came from. Gangs formed on every corner. You know, I come from Fulton and Rockaway also. Uh, so John Gotti's younger brother, Vinny, was part of what we call the FNR gang. So that's where I started be, being a participant of. And, you know, uh, I was a, a short young kid and, you know, I had to fight my way around. You know, there was we didn't understand bullies. We, you know, we just used to say, you know, don't pick on me. We didn't say don't bully, bully me, but we just said don't, I didn't want to be picked on. So I would do whatever it took to, to be the tough little kids so when people wouldn't bother me. 
And that's just how I grew up and got involved with the FNR gang. And that was like a street gang that, you know, if you went from one one area to another area, you knew you were going to end up getting into a fight. Or if somebody came into your area, you knew that you were going to have to fight them. Kind of like a turf kind of thing. So anyway, but that's just how I grew up. Yeah, I um I was just in East New York East New York area. I went out to um, link up with a friend of mine, and um I was in um I I actually uh, was in the East New York area. I I jumped on the subway on uh, Grand Avenue, um the Grand Avenue area. I, I don't know if you're familiar with that area. That's right outside Fulton and uh, Rockaway, right? Well, no, Grant 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 Avenue, G R A N T. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's a little bit. That's more East New York. Me, I'm a little bit more bed style. Ocean Hill Brownsville is what my neighborhood was called. But we started with like East New York Avenue was just a couple of blocks away. So we called it part of East New York and, and, and things like that. But yeah, that would be a little bit down further, like towards the Picking Avenue and, and stuff like that there. So yeah, I'm familiar with that that area also. I mean, that's the area where I used to, you know, when I got involved with drugs, that's where I used to go and cop a lot of my drugs was around that area. Yeah. Um, and then like, you know, in that area, um, from what my, my friend was showing me in that area, cause, uh, you know, he was, he was kind of familiar with the life and stuff like that. There was, um, back in your day, you know, they made that, they made the movie that a lot of people know about, like Goodfellas, uh, the Lucchese's like Jimmy Burke and, uh, Tommy D. Simone and, uh, Henry Hill and all them, they were in the East New York area as well, correct? Yeah, they were, but they then they, they they migrated to to uh, Queens. So a lot of them, a lot of people just started shifting from the East New York area into the Queens area. So Jimmy Burke and them, or yeah, originated from from East New York, uh, the club that they had back in, when they were younger. And then you know, if you've seen the movie Goodfellas, it shows you a lot of. And if my 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 own uh, uh, opinion is. That would probably be the most realistic movie. I mean, some of it was 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 not, not true or, or not correct, but a, a lot of it was, and that was my neighborhood. And I was uh, not friends with them, like a friend, because they were a different family than I grew up in, uh, but uh, they were acquaintances. I, I knew of them and knew them. And matter of fact, Jimmy Burke's son, Frankie Burke, became a real good friend of mine. Yeah, you were saying like, you know, growing up, um, you guys were in your younger years, you know, you were, you know, you you, you rolled with that, the gang, uh, Fulton Ave Rockaway boys, they, they you know, you were, uh, you were good friends that was uh, linked with like, um, a lot of the historic uh, mob figures that now today, a lot of people talk about that, uh, unfortunately, got older and passed on. Um, but you were good friends with like, um, Vinny Gotti, which was like John Gotti's brother and Gene Gotti was friends with your sister, right? His other brother? Yeah, Gene Gotti, in the beginning when I was younger, Gene Gotti was one of my idols. I I, I remember Gene, I think he, he had moved out of East New York, and we, he had a, a storefront, and I was probably maybe about 13, 14 years old, and they had a storefront right down the block from where I lived, and I used to go there, and it was, you know, I didn't know who they were really at that time, but Gene Gotti would come there and visit once in a while, and I still remember the car he drove, the clothes he wore, the cologne he even had on. I mean, it was just something. And I, and he was one of my first idols. And then that club closed down and they moved someplace else. And that's when I started migrating more to Eastern Parkway and Herkimer Street and uh, Ronnie One on and, and those type of guys. So where, so who did, who did you meet? Uh, I know that like three of the guys that, you know, kind of got you involved in life was, you know, Fat Andy Ruggiano, Ronnie One Arm and Nikki Carrazzo. Um, who did you meet first out of those guys that kind of got you involved in? Like, how did you run into them? Out of those guys, it would have been Ronnie One Arm because when we were kids, you know, I was from Fulton Rockway. He was from Eastern Parkway. And when I used to go to, to Pacific Street right by Eastern Parkway, we encountered one another. So Ronnie would have been, been the first one. Uh, then I started hanging out in Queens and met Fat Andy's son, Anthony Ruggiano, uh, Jr., and uh, became his friend. And his dad would have a friend. Now, his dad was one of the first, from my understanding, wise guys in my neighborhood. Because uh, he got straightened out and made a member of the Gambino crime family at a really young age. And he kind of like ran the neighborhood. 
So he would have a spread, like a meal every Friday night, and his son would bring me with him. And that was kind of like why I got infatuated with, really got infatuated and plugged into that lifestyle through uh, Anthony Ruggiano. Yeah, I mean, I mean uh, Fat Andy, I mean, you know, um, he uh, goes back, I think, even farther than the Gambino days because he was, um, wasn't, I believe, historically, from what it was documented, he was a bodyguard for Albert Anastasia before the Gambinos became the Gambinos, right? Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure which which one straightened him out. I mean, his son would know that. I could always get that information because me and his son are still good friends. But, uh, you know, Fat Andy had passed away or, or a while back. But, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, but you're, you're going back into those days. Yeah, and that's what I'm saying. He was a, young, a really one of the youngest guys straightened out back in them days. You know, so he was... I think maybe 20 something years old. Yeah. And then uh, Nicky Carrazzo, he was one of your um, mentors, uh, correct? Nicky, yeah, because what happened is I got uh, locked up. Well, I didn't get locked up. I was wanted for a murder case. And Fat Andy uh, hid me and his, his godson out. Me and his godson were wanted, wanted for the murder in Queens. And uh, they hid me out. And then Mickey and them came and uh, threw Fat Andy, of course, because they were underneath Fat Andy. They weren't even trained out at that time. They came and hit me out, and I started hanging out with them. So Nikki had a real big, I think the big influence in my life in the mafia lifestyle was Nikki. He groomed me. Um, I drove his car. Me and him were really close. He was like my, my, my father. Uh, so uh, me and Nikki got really close. So um, <clears throat> when you were 20, um, for, from what I, you know, from what I read and stuff, when you were 20, that's when you got your first real um, taste of a serious case. Um, you were just saying that was when you were um, put on trial for a big, a big case. Yeah, I, like I said, I was, Nikki was hiding me out in, in Brooklyn. My case was in Queens, so I was hiding out in his area. And, and like I said, he, he became my, my dad in, in the sense me and him were really close. We did a lot of things. I did a lot of things with him and for him. But uh, what happened is I ended up getting locked up for possession of a weapon and under a phony name. When I went back to court, that's when they arrested me for two murders. So back in, in that day that you're talking about, 20 years old, I was arrested for possession of a weapon and two murders, uh, and I had to lay up in jail for a while. And then one of those murder cases, I had to go on trial, with, which was five eyewitnesses against me. And I was offered a lot of pleas. Uh, I wouldn't take the plea deal. And uh, and but like after that trial, I think that's when, you know, I started really getting a big reputation. And Nikki would parade me around as the up and coming star in the Gambino crime family. And really went to my head, to be honest with you. Oh, ego's ego's a big thing. I mean, you know, when you know, we'll get into that, you know, down the road. I mean, especially with you know me and you prior to living the life of addiction, um, ego's a big thing. I mean, you start getting a filled ego. I mean, it really does fuel the fire. Well, without a doubt. So, yeah, and he would parade me around to different bosses, different families, and I would be hanging out on Mulberry Street with him. And meeting the uh, O'Neill Della Gross, who was which is the underboss of the family, and and I don't know, I, I I became a legend in my own mind. Let me put it that way. Well, I'll tell you, Robert. I mean, you're going back to the uh, the late '70s, early '80s. I'm going to say when you were around 20 years old, right? No, I was you know, going back into the the the, the mid '70s. Yeah, like, I mean '54. So. Well, let's well, let's just put it this way. I'm it's 2022. And when I went to Ozone Park uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I went to East New York and stuff, it's you're still you're still a legend in the neighborhood. So whatever you did, you uh, they said when Robert when when Robert showed up, it, so, something was going down. So you still have a very strong reputation. Um, maybe not the reputation that you that you would like to have now with the ventures that you're having, but people still have a lot of respect for you. You definitely. Uh, made an impact that you were no man to mess with. That, that is, you know, that, that would be very truthful. I, I, I did. And, and uh, part of that was, I, I believe, in, you know, when I look back at my life is that I didn't have any value for my life. So people knew I didn't have any value for anybody else's life. And I think 
uh, that was a, a big factor in my reputation is people knew if they messed with me, chances were they weren't going to be around. Yeah, no doubt. Um, so, you know, y you're saying, I heard you say a couple times about Nikki Carrazzo, and um, if you don't want to answer this question, that's fine. Um, you know, you, you said a couple times he was like your father. Um, did your, did, was your father still in your life in your 20s or... Yeah, my father was always there, but the, the thing was that my father was there, but but not there. If that makes any sense, I didn't have a great connection with my dad. Was he was he involved in the life, or was he out? No, no, my mom, dad, legitimate people worked hard for their life. You know, that's kind of like when I share a lot of my testimony. I explain three types of people who influenced my life, or people who. Uh, um, had an impact on my life in one way or another. And my mom and dad loving people, but their struggles having ends meet. So at an early age, I didn't want to be like my mom and dad having those struggles, trying to support a family, pay rent, put food on the table. A lot of those arguments in my home would be over finances. So I didn't want to be that. And then, you know, when you go back into the sixties, we had the Vietnam War. A lot of my older friends were coming back there. And they were all messed up with either drugs or drinking, and I didn't want to be like them. And then you had the guys that were outside that club that I mentioned. And those were the guys that looked like they had it all together. Nice clothes, you know, had everything that I would want for myself if I got older. Not knowing the lifestyle itself at that point in time, but just wanted to be like them. And I gravitated towards that. I mean, that sounds ideal. I mean, your life story just right now summed up sounds like the movie of the bronx tale i mean you know you think robert de niro was a you know an everyday working guy he was you know a bus driver struggled to make ends meet. the kid sees the image of you know the gangsters on the corner they were dressed sharp they always had money people respected them and uh you know like once again like you talk about ego like you start seeing that and you know that's the life that portrays to be you know that's the life i want but like little did like little do people know when at a young age like that the severe consequences that come with it that i'm sure that you've had to live through that we can get into as we go on with this interview yeah as you mentioned bronx tale how they i i won't be able to say they called him c sonny called him c in the movie uh, how him and and sonny connected would be how me and and, and uh, nikki carrazzo connected you know, I looked up to him. He brought me around, or he was the the face of everything, and, and it was just a, a great feeling to be around a guy like Nicky Carrazzo. Everybody probably loved him. Everybody probably respected him. Um, you know, and that's the guy that you wanted to be. You know, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I think now we learn um, as life goes on. I mean, I've obviously not even came close to a fraction of the stuff that you lived through. But I, um, I do realize that I, I know growing up, I grew up in a bar. My dad had a, a bar business for 38 years, and um, I really didn't hang out with guys my age. I hung out with the, like, the guys that were in the bar that rolled with my dad that, you know, a lot of them, I mean, you know and I know being in previous addictions, people that hang out in a bar during, a day, during the day aren't really probably the people that you want to be idolizing. And I like I idolize a lot of those guys for the wrong reasons because you know some of them were local tough guys. You know I wanted I wanted to be like that. Um, you know they had beautiful women with them. They always had wads of money on them. You know that in my eyes, I always thought that was the right way to live. And um, I didn't realize that you know a lot of that stuff came with consequence. Came with. Uh, it didn't take I you know a lot of my friends went out to college after high school I didn't I went into the family business so hanging out with these people that were associated with my father like that and they weren't I'm gonna make that clear to everybody on this interview my dad was not an organized crime um he you know he was a he was a bar owner none of his friends were an organized crime um you know I'm from the northeast section of uh, Pennsylvania um these guys some of them ran legitimate businesses, some of them didn't, but it had nothing to do with organized crime whatsoever. Um, but to get back on track, um, that put a bad uh, mindset in my mind because I tried fast track in my life and getting on their level with trying to do things with quick results, but it came with quick consequences and it, it, it actually put me farther behind to restart my life at a later age. But 
I appreciate it because that was the road that I feel as though God made me travel on for a reason because now I get to come on my podcast. If I didn't live the life that I did because of those reasons, I wouldn't be able to come here today with you and other people and instill hope and faith in other people that, you know, because of the poor decisions I made in my past, in my past younger years, it inspires me to come on and tell my story and bring out other people that can relate to my story that also turn negatives into positives and want to inspire people to change and don't fall down that road because with quick, with quick, um, quick decisions come with quick consequences is what I'm saying. I agree. And that, that's kind of like, that, 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 oh, I, I think society is in right now. It's the instant gratification kind. We don't think of consequences. We just we respond whatever's going to satisfy us at that point in time without thinking. That's one of the things I do today is when I speak to young kids, I try to emphasize the importance of consequential thinking. That's what I, how I talk to my daughter today too is consequential thinking. Think about the consequences before the action because if you don't, you'll probably do the action and have to suffer the consequences. Absolutely. That's very solid advice. Um, so Robert, what would you say? <clears throat> so, you know, you're obviously at 20 years old, you were on trial, you know, you had uh, charges for, you know, weapon charges, um, conspiracy to uh, commit murder and, and stuff like that. So you were an active member inside the life. Um, what, at what point did your addiction start taking into place? And like, could you, cause I can kind of map out, when my addiction started and my, I was addicted to alcohol very heavily and you know, some recreational stuff came with it, but that didn't grasp me like alcohol did. And as I told you, I was in the bar scene. So I always thought that that was normal behavior. At what point, how old were you? Like when you started becoming addicted to any sort of substances and if you can remember. Well, let me just go back. I, I, I look at back at my life and it, I think it was just more, and, and it's part of the addiction uh, uh, um, mentality, but I see myself as OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder that I have. That's how I see it because even at a young age, I, I gambled. I mean, gambling was my addiction. I mean, I pitched pennies, I pitched quarters, went to racetracks, you know, gambling sports and all that. And I was probably 14, 15, 16 years old. So I got obsessed with a lot of that stuff. And, uh, and then hanging out in bars and drinking, I mean, that was part of the, you know, what I did. So I didn't see it as an addiction at that point in time. I just look back at it now and I can see how it gravitated. But as far as with the drugs and it bringing me to my knees, it happened when I started hanging out in, in Mul on Mulberry Street. We had some some crap games, dice games there. Uh, of course, they were all illegal. And uh, and a lot of the guys there were, were big money guys. I'm talking about big money. And I would try to find out, like, you know, these guys would come and lose $10,000, $15,000 a day, man. I go, where do you get that kind of money from? And most of them were at that point in time, not all of them, but a lot of them were involved with the, the drug business, you know? So I figured, okay, that's the next step up. If I can, if you know, one thing I learned that if you have a lot of money, you have a lot of friends. If you have a lot of friends, you gain a lot of power and especially in that lifestyle, you know? Uh, so I figured that was it for me. And then, you know, I started doing that and the recreational drugs. I, went and drink and I bring a little coke with me or somebody would have a little coke. I do a little bit. And it was that, that for a while. And then what happened is it got the best of me later on. I'd say probably in, uh, the middle late eighties. Yeah. I mean, I mean, as you know, I mean, you know, you were saying, you know, earlier, I mean, you know, you have those drugs on you. I mean, I wasn't really heavily into the drugs, um, as much as I was the drinking, but I'm not going to say I didn't have drugs on me because what, if I had drugs on me, it brought women around. And not the not the right women, but when you're young, it's the women you want to be around, it, and that fed and that fed my ego. Exactly, exactly. Uh, we, we, you know, I, I don't, I definitely don't want to bash anybody, but basically, we, we paid in a in a way that we, we were paying for sex. You know, what by providing drugs and stuff like that for people to so way you know, the young girls at that point in time. I mean, that's how my life was anyway, you know. Um, 
Yeah, and, and then the late 80s, uh, you know, I started selling drugs and then I started doing the drugs. And before you know it, the drugs was doing me and, and that got, got me, you know, and I had a gambling problem and a drug problem at the same time. And I couldn't do both. So the drugs took hold of me more than anything else. And, uh, you know, that's when Freebasin came around, crack cocaine came around. It was a cheaper high and I would lose everything and that would be what I would do, I'd stretch, stretch up 30, 40, 50, 100 bucks and buy crack cocaine and get high. How old were you at that point, or roughly? I was in my probably uh, late 30s. So at this point, are you still an active member with the crime families? Because, you know, they stay traditionally, but I think that tradition, I mean, as you know, traditions, if you look at, if you look at the timeline of the mob and organized crime, the traditions have deteriorated uh through decade after decade after decade but at this point you're in your 30s if you're still associated in the life traditionally they say the mafia they frowned on any drug dealing or any drug use um were you still active in the life at this point with the, the gambinos and stuff that when you were heavily in, in addict that's what kind of separated me a lot i mean the drugs took i was a different type i wasn't a guy that could get high and then go around people if I got high, I got high for weeks out of a time, sometimes <clears throat> months out of a time, sometimes six, eight months out of a time. And the last time from, from 1976 uh, to 1977, I was high every day. So that separated me. Nikki couldn't get involved with me. Nikki got straightened out. I was still around him at that point, in, at some point in time, doing a little drugs, but not really getting addicted to it. And then before you know it, when the drugs came in, I'd run away from everybody. i go to a hotel room. And stay there for a couple of weeks as much as the money that i had with me i could afford and get high and you know the girls in the party scene but i ran and hid away i became very paranoid too with the drugs i didn't want to be around a lot of people so the people that were around you that were at one time you know um you know guys that you idolized and you know the people that were in the life with you and stuff like that they they obviously knew that you had a drug problem without a doubt yeah People would start staying away, away from me, and, and you know, like, like I said, in that lifestyle, I didn't blame them. I was, I was, hey, listen, I was an embarrassment to the mob. I was an embarrassment to my family. I was an embarrassment to myself. I lost all self-respect. I, I came to the point where I'm Robert the Crackhead. I'm probably going to die Robert the Crackhead. I didn't see no future for me anymore. And uh, that's just it. You know, I, um, I, I didn't start actively getting. You know, I was. I was able to keep it together for a couple of years, but I didn't start getting active into addiction until probably my, I'd say like my early twenties. Um, when I was a teenager, I, I, you know, I was an athlete. I, um, I was big into fitness. I was a boxer. I, you know, I was into, uh, fixing up cars and hanging out with girls and I had my stuff together. Um, it was when I, you know, started drinking and started getting into the club scene. I mean, as you know, when I was in my early twenties and you were in your early twenties, you probably lived through the disco era. Yeah. Especially in New York City. I mean, that was I mean, New York City disco era, I mean, was iconic. I mean, how many movies did they make about it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was a big thing. For me, uh every night when I was still active with the mob and making money, uh every night, like after everything was set aside, I would go to a different disco Every night I had a different disco that I would be going to. So I, I, that was my lifestyle was going and hanging out in discos, drinking, doing a little coke. And that was when I was still a little bit manageable, you know, where it didn't get, get the best of me. But it progressively came to that. And, you know, like, I, like we were talking earlier, you know, how it progressively just gets worse. I mean, I became that guy that was an embarrassment. I wasn't a social... I wasn't able to hide it. Like people knew when I was, when I was messed up, like when I was constantly walking around and I was like, you know, I would go on my binges. So like you said, you know, you go weeks at a time and then you would like, you know, I would shut it down and then it was like a vicious cycle. So like I would, I would joke about it and I still joke about it till this day, but it's not a joke, but like some people, you know, they'd be like, Oh, like people that don't know that I was, you know, active in addiction and stuff. And they'd be like, Hey, you want to go out for a couple of drinks after work? I'm like, you better clear your schedule. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I I I say this when I share when I share get the chance to go places and share my testimony that I was once the up and coming star, the Gambino crime family, and then everybody in the neighborhood knew 
I was Robert the crackhead. Yeah, and you know, that's when I was in my early 20s, I was the guy everybody called on Friday nights because I would have the best parties. Everybody yeah. wanted to come to my parties. I'd have, you know, the, 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 the best people, like popular people would be there, popular for the wrong reasons, but like people, you know, a lot of people would be at my house and everybody would be calling me. And then it turned into when I started drinking, um, that's when my mental health, I real I didn't realize it then, I realize it now that my mental health took over and nobody was safe. Like anything could have happened. It could have been a good night, yeah. had a good night, but then there could have been nights where, you know, I smashed a bottle over somebody's face or um, I, I got violent or I, I, um, I, you know, damaged property at my own parents' house or somebody else's property. Um, you know, always, always the next day, not wanting to wake up and having severe anxiety because I would, you know, say like, I'd wake up and it'd be like a blur and I'd be like, what did I do last night? You know, it was, it was, I was unpredictable. Um, I, I always would say, you know, nobody's safe when I'm around because I always feared and I thank God to this day that nothing happened, but I always feared waking up one day and, you know, you know, hearing that I killed somebody, you know, I, I might have drove a car, not not in the right state of mind. I hit somebody walking or, you know, um, hitting somebody with an object or, you know, beating somebody up and doing something that put them into the hospital. You know, that was always like a big fear of mine. And um, I would get anxiety from it. And then I would start using it again the next day I just to take my mind off of it. Yeah. So I always say to a lot of people I, like I try and sponsor now is, you know, it's not hard to go to a meeting and listen to other people's stories and share. But a lot of times, unless you get your mental health in check, it's going to be hard for you to stay sober for a long term. Because like you said, with the addictive personalities. Yeah, well, uh, that, that was uh, that's why. Like I said, I, I could use hindsight now, look back and see a lot of things, you know, or, or behavior patterns in my, my life. But one thing a lot of people notice, even in my, my tough guy days, was if I was drinking martinis, gin martinis, every drive a couple of hours, if people see me drinking, they know a lot of people just started avoiding me. They knew that somebody was going to get hit, something bad was going to, those set me off. I don't know what it was about them. But I used to like them a lot. So, <laughs> but yeah. So I understand where you're coming from with all with all that there. But you know, uh, I have to tell you, um, you know, I look back and and you know, all the things that I did and some of the things that maybe if I didn't do, I'd still be okay in good standings with the mob, really climbing up the ladder, probably having a lot of money, whatever it is. But. I have to tell you, if anything changed back then, I don't think I'd be where I am today. So I don't regret any of it. Uh, I'm happy where I am today. So, and that's the most important thing for me. Because I feel as though we followed our path. Like, I, like a lot of times I would be staring down at the, uh, the bottom of a water bottle and it'd be filled with vodka and I, I'd be hiding, you know, doing really stuff that wasn't me. And my addiction took over and I would say to myself, I'd sometimes get on my hands and knees and say like, you know, God, why? I always believed in God. I'm like, God, why, why are you doing this? You know, like, why am I going through this? And it's till today that I realized that if I didn't lead that path that I led back then, how would I be sitting here today having the sober sit down? Exactly. How, how would I be the, a messenger to explain to other people? And, you know, as far as the sober sit down is concerned, like, uh, and and as far as sobriety is concerned, I think society has a big misconception is like, well, why are you out there promoting sobriety? Like, do you look at other people that, you know, drink or do this as, as bad people? No, I do not. Anybody that can conduct themselves that it doesn't alter their life in a negative way. You can have a couple drinks and go home at the end of the night. Congratulations. I can sit there and have a conversation with somebody that can keep themselves in check and have two drinks at dinner. That doesn't bother me. That doesn't affect me. Um, you know, I, I just want people to know that if you are living that life that it's affecting you negatively, maybe it's time that you should make some changes. And I'm not here. We're trying to recruit people to become sober because I'm sober. As you know, in sobriety, this isn't a, I do, you do world just because right. we had problems doesn't mean other people have problems. Gotcha. And, and I don't judge people if they don't think that they don't have a problem and they don't live a, a, a good life then that's on them. All I can do is give my advice. And if I'm loud about my sobriety, 
somebody that's being quiet about their struggles may hear me one day and I might inspire them to lead them a better life. Exactly. Sharing your experience, strength, and hope. And, um, you know, you know, now I, these days, you know, like you said, we have addictive personalities. So I'm sure there's days that, you know, you still have things like you said, you have OCD, stuff like that, where now I learned how to channel my addiction into more positive ways. Instead of making a negative into a negative, I turn a negative into a positive. So if my mind's racing one day and I, I don't know what to do with myself, where years ago I would have fed into my addiction. Now I just try and motivate myself to do more. Like um, I go into work, I try doing twice the amount of work that I would do. I go to the gym. I, you know, try and do things for my family, um, try and, you know, keep my house in order. There's different things that I try and do to keep that addiction, that addictive mindset in check to turn negatives into positives rather than making them negatives. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. The best way to replace a, a, a bad or get rid of a bad habit is replace it with a good habit. So. Um, so Robert, you, you know, you're in your thirties and you know, you're active in addiction, you know, you're going through a lot, you're, you know, violence, um, you know, uh, taking yourself down probably the, the worst path that you could possibly be at, at that point. What was the, what was the, the point that the line was drawn and your life changed for the better? Well, in, in 1976, I, I was living with my mom in Florida. I got a little advice from some of the guys from the neighborhood, and they said, you, you need to really go and leave the neighborhood. And somebody gave me a plane ticket to go live with my mom in Florida. And I, I moved to Florida with my mom, and my addiction kicked up all over again there. And uh, my mom couldn't take it anymore. It's the first time my mom said, yeah, I just can't do it anymore with you yet. You can't stay here. So. I was supposed to go to a rehab center. We had friends that, that worked in a daytop center in, in New York, and I was supposed to fly back to New York and go there. Instead of that, I met some friends and started getting high again, and that never happened. Long story short, 1976, I was living on the streets completely homeless. I didn't have a place of my own to live. I mean, I wasn't sleeping in the streets unless I passed out, and that did happen sometimes. But I, you know, I would go from crack house or one friend's house to another friend's house. I didn't have my own. Uh, 1993, my daughter was born, so I'm going to go back that a little bit, and I really thought that was going to help me have more responsibility and take care of myself, but I walked out of her life when she was only uh, seven weeks old just to get high again, and that led me to 1996 being homeless. In 95, when I was living with my mom in Florida, Mickey and them came to Florida, gave me some stuff to do in Florida, and later on, I found out that uh, somebody who was uh, working for the, the government that was friends of ours, uh, undercover, and um, the case happened there for a RICO case, and I was wanted for a drug case in New York at the same time, and uh, didn't show up in court anymore. And what I say, in 1997, January 23rd, 1997, how I share the story is I got a visit by two angels. No, they weren't halos or anything. They were warrant officers. I was wanted. I call them my angels because that's the last time I had a drink at a drug. It was 1997, January 23rd. So I got arrested for the warrant brought to Rikers Island and uh, laid up in Rikers Island. I knew I wasn't going to get any bail anymore because I already knew the feds wanted me also. So I knew they were going to come and, and uh, make put a a hold on me. So I knew that was my case. So what I was trying to do is get everybody who might have owed me a favor or something like that, or, you know, wanted to look out for me. I tried to get money for a good attorney to get me out of the mess I got myself into. And they get commissary money for to live as comfortable as I can while I'm incarcerated. So I'm calling up a lot of people. Everybody's giving me to run around. One girl told me, why don't you go read the Bible? And I thought that was a brush off. But my daughter's mom, after not allowing me to see my daughter through my addiction, after she was, I think the last time I seen her, she was one years old. Throughout that period, of, well, my daughter's mom was allowing me to talk to my daughter over the phone. And this one time I'm talking to her and she was crying. And her name is Brianna. And I said, Brianna, why are you crying? And she said, because you won't come and see me. Well, I have to tell you that those words broke my heart, shattered my heart. And uh, 
I just started crying. I didn't want the inmates to see me. So I slammed the phone down and ran back to my cell. And like you, I knew about God, but I didn't know God. I knew about God. I was raised Roman Catholic myself. And I'm not saying that for every Catholic, but for me, I knew about him, but didn't know him. Didn't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ at that point in time. And I just ran back to my cell and I said, God, if you're real, either have somebody kill me or change me. I, I can't live with the pain. Now, if I was out on the street, I would have went and got high all over again. But I'm incarcerated and the drugs weren't that free. They're there, but they weren't that free to do. So I had to deal with all that pain at one time. I just realized how many times was I in the neighborhood of where my daughter lived. And I'd rather get high than go see my own daughter. Or even I'm tempted to go see my own daughter. Whether her mother would have let me or not, that's not the issue. I never even tried to go see my own daughter. I'd rather be in the streets getting high than see my own daughter. So that affected me so great that I cried on my knees. I said, God, please help me. God, please help me. And I truly believe at that point in time, God answered the sincerity of my cry of my heart. And I was born again. And Jesus Christ, I accepted him as my Lord and Savior. Yeah, it's very, uh, it's very touching and I can totally relate to it. Um, you know, there's a lot of times that I didn't want to, I have a kid of my own and, you know, there was a lot of times when she was born, um, her early years, there was a lot of times that I took for granted, um, when she was a young baby and, um, you know, I had every opportunity to spend as much time as I wanted with her. But as you said, you know, we chose the, we chose to put addiction, um, our addictions were too strong at that point that we were weak ourselves. Um, and there's nothing like, I like how you said it, you know, you had to deal with that internal pain probably for the first time, you know, and that you actually got that deep to the core with yourself and you didn't have drugs to distort those feelings. You actually felt those feelings for the first time. Yeah. And it, they weren't distorted by, you know, drugs or alcohol and they, you know, they, they were, you know, they were real feelings and you felt them. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't hide from it anymore. I, I couldn't uh, meditate, med medicate it anymore. Uh, and I had to deal with the reality of my life and where I was. And I tell you, I was in a state of complete hopelessness before I got on my knees and cried to God for help. Uh, what the point is, I'm Robert the Crackhead. This is probably how I'm going to die. And I accepted that, but I thank God he had a different plan for me. So do you, do you, do you feel as though back when you were doing, you know, work with the, with the organized crime and stuff like that, were you, were you using, were you using then? And when you were using, did that, how do I say it? Um, did that make you more like fearless? Because, like, at one point in time, like, when you got in with those guys, were you doing it at a sober point, or were you always using while in the life of organized crime? No, once I started using, I, I became less violent, to be honest with you. I, I got very proud. I felt that wasn't, um, I don't know the right word to say, um, capable of handing that life because... I was getting high. My 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 senses weren't there. I, I just was very. I didn't want to do anything really. I just you know when I started getting high, went to the point. I mean, there was times, uh, if I was out in a bar getting high and drinking at the same time, it wasn't really bad. I go home and go to sleep. But once it got past that extreme, uh, I became so less violent. I was get very paranoid. I knew I was very vulnerable. A lot of enemies that I made, they could see me in the state that I was in and take advantage of me. So I hid myself. That's why I used to hide in hotels a lot. Yeah, the reason I asked that is because, you know, I know that that life could, you know, make make some, make, you know, any, everybody's got feelings. And, you know, that life could make you, you know, you're going to be put in some situations and some scenarios that, your mind does have to be able to think, you know, I know this isn't right, but I got to do it. Um, and I just feel as though, like, when I was on my first day of sobriety, I went to a meeting and I had my head down and I was I was in the meeting and I was listening in to, like, whatever the people had to say. I was new to, like, a program and stuff like that. And this guy, um, he owns a pizzeria locally, and uh, he said something that still touched me to this day. He said... Uh, 
he opened he opened the meeting. He said, you know, I was afraid to fly, but give me a drink and I'll fly the airplane. Mm-hmm. And you know what I say about that is like drugs and alcohol can make us do things that where normal everyday consequences don't exist in our mind. So I want I was the to relate back to the question was you know I was trying to understand where you were coming from that you know were were you pushed into using because it made it easier for you to do some of the things that you had to do living in that life i truly believe today i was my using was running away from who i who i was i i was just a, a bad tempered vicious violent person drinking did bring on some of that false bravado to be honest with you or like when i had those martinis i was ready to tackle the world you know but once the drug came into my life, I think more and more what I was trying to do was run away from myself. So you want it, you want it change in your life, but you needed that one thing that was going to take you like, you know, like I, I related to you, um, you know, that last visit in the hospital. I mean, it wasn't the first time I was in the hospital. It wasn't the first time, you know, I was putting handcuffs for, you know, doing something that I, I, I did wrong there was something about this time around that made it differently. The last time that I was, you know, that I had my last time I was in the hospital and almost lost my life. But, you know, when you went to, when you went to jail that time, you said like those, those two guys that served you the warrant that were your two guardian angels, you went to jail that kept you away from the distortions of being on the streets of being able to have such easy access to the drugs you know, how long were you, how long were you incarcerated for, um, during that time, roughly? At that, at that point, well, for, for that whole stay, uh, of course, I don't know if you know this or not, but I cooperated with the government. That's why I wrote the book called The Witness. But anyway, uh, but I stay from that point in time, uh, I think it was about 29, 30 months all total of my time. But I, I wanted to say this here to you, because I was listening to what you were saying. I've been in and out of prisons a lot of times. I've been in and out of rehabs a lot of times. Uh, I think the difference between this time and all those other times is the only thing I really wanted to change was the consequences, not the lifestyle. I love the lifestyle. I just wanted to change the consequences. I wanted to be still a gangster, but just didn't want to be a gangster that used drugs. I wanted to be a social user, but didn't want to set up for the consequences of the addiction. So all of those things added up at that point in time of my life. So I realized one thing, the problem was Robert. No matter where I go, I was taking me with me. So I was the problem. And uh, God got hold of that and, and changed that for me. So I'm not sure if I answered the exact question you wanted, but I just wanted to bring that out a little bit is that uh, a lot of us want consequences to change, but we don't want to change anything about ourselves. And it usually doesn't work that way. My first spot, my first sponsor said to me that, um, you know, he's like, you'll come here for your drinking, but you're going to stay for your thinking. Like uh-huh. you said, it's, it's us, you know, like it's the way we process things as addicts with the addictive personalities. It's the way we process things that makes us react and have the consequences that we had all through our lives. We just didn't know how to actually sit there and evaluate how we were thinking and process it out, we would turn it into a negative rather than a positive. Exactly. And, um, you know, I always say, you know, when somebody, you know, is a previous addict and, you know, you have to do some time in jail or you go to rehab, I feel as though no matter what, like, that puts you kind of, like you said, there. You, I, I know there's certain rehabs that don't run their facilities the right way and there's access to drugs. Same thing with prisons, um, but it's just a little harder to get them as as easy as it is to get on the streets i say you know when people get out of rehab they get out of jail no matter how much time they do the real time starts when you get back out on the streets and you start trying to live a normal life again when you have the distortions and uh the obstacles and all that so when you got out of jail what advice could you give to people in that situation what what did you do differently when you got out of jail that last time that kept you on your straightened path? Well, you know, as I said, uh, first of all, I was relocated by the government. So, uh, placed in a witness protection program. 
after I left my prison time and got relocated to San Antonio, Texas. And basically what kept me, out because, because of my my uh, uh, supervised release, uh, I had to still make AA meetings and NA meetings and all that there. But what changed my life was, I, I truly believe, was um, allowing Jesus Christ to live in my life and live through my life. So when I was holed up in a hotel room before I would leave to go any meeting, before I would leave to go outside, I just got into the word of God and I would read the word of God. You know, Before I even left prison, I put the Bible on the floor and I would put my head in the Bible and nothing, nothing uh, 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 magical about it, but I think uh, God was honoring uh, the sincerity of my, my, my belief with him, in him. And I put my head in it and I'd say, God, let your word penetrate my mind that I never forget it. Then I'll put my chest in the Bible, lay it on the floor, put my chest in the Bible and say, God, let your word penetrate my heart that I will live by it. And from that point in time, I mean, even from the first time that I cried out for God for help, the only thing I did at that point in time through all my jail time and all that there was, that's not the only thing, but the most important thing was staying in God's word, reading God's word, attending Bible studies, and just getting more of God in me. Because I think the renewing of the mind is one of the biggest things we can do for ourselves, whether addiction or even just suffering bad consequences to bad decisions. We need to get our mind renewed. And, you know, the mind is like a computer. What you put into it is what you get out of it. If you put in to your computer, I want a pizza shop, you're not going to get a hamburger place. You're going to get a pizza shop. So I think the renewing of the mind was big. So I was getting God's word into my mind to renew my mind to think the way he would want me to think. So as you said, that time would be when the transformation of you bringing Jesus Christ into your life was during that time? Well, it started when I was in prison, but it manifests itself even more when I'm outside of prison. Because, you know, there's certain things in prison, you're not, the temptations you're not going to have to face. And somebody said that to me. They said, you know, you, you, you being this religious guy, of course, you're locked up. But what about when you go out there, you're going to do those certain things? And, uh, and that was uh, when I would pray for like 60 days straight. I would just pray and, uh, and, and ask God to just help me, you know, fight the temptations when I know when I walk out of this jail cell, they're going to be there. Would you feel that when you came out at that point in time that your new addiction was living a religious lifestyle? Well, yeah, obsessive compulsive disorder. I got obsessed with Jesus Christ and I followed him to the end. The way I used to chase crack cocaine is how I chase Jesus Christ today. Once again, it's taken, you know, the addictive mindset and not giving a negative result. You do it in a positive way. Now, your new addiction is a positive addiction. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, some so, people say he's crazy and I say, yeah, I might be enough, but at least I'm screwed on to the right bolt. I, I always say when some people say crazy or normal, like, you know, I always, you know, tell people, you know, that word normal or crazy, it shouldn't exist. It doesn't exist. It's, it's normal is based off somebody else's perception of what they feel as though is normal. Yeah. So there really is no normal. Like what's normal to you isn't normal to me. What's normal to me isn't normal to you, but we can kind of, everyone can kind of relate to one another. Um, but it's, I feel as though normal and crazy is just a, a it's a crazy word. <laughs> But um, so you have the two books out right now. Oh, I mean, I'm sorry. You have the one book out, which is called The Witnesses, uh, pretty much a story of your life and what you've been through, correct? Yes, yes. I was a witness for the government. Now I'm a witness for Jesus. And that's and that's where that the title comes from. And it kind of is a autobiography of your life, kind of. It's kind of an autobiography. Of course, we, we had to put it nonfiction because, you know, some things we had to change. And then some events, there's a time in between that we had to fill it in with something. So, yeah. So, uh, I would say it's based on my life story. It's based on, a, on uh, I guess, based on a true-to-life story. And um, for those people that are watching, um, make sure, you know, when um, you guys are done watching our segment, below in the description will be a link for you to check out. Robert's books um, called The Witness. Now, Robert, before we went on today, me and you were talking, um, you said you have another project coming up that you're in the works of another book coming out? Yeah, we're working on it as of, as, of, as we talk. Uh, we're working on, it's going to be called The Transformed Gangster. 
the first book is showing the life that I lived and, and how God has changed my life. But now I want to bring more into action how it's never too late for any anybody. It's never too late for a new beginning for anybody and how God, through Jesus Christ, his son, the sacrifice he made on the cross on my behalf, on our behalf, on the world's behalf, uh, how he could transform someone's life from where I was to where I am today. Yeah, that's very inspirational. I mean, that's kind of, you know, what I'm trying to instill here on this platform. Like, a lot of people still don't get it. You know, um, I like, you know, the sober sit down. Um, you know, I battled addiction, you know, um, doing certain things that I shouldn't have probably did in my lifetime. However, it's to instill hope and faith in those that are struggling to explain to people that it's never too late, it's never too late to make those changes. And then, you know, a lot of people, they say to me, like, you know, you have a lot of awful previous guys that were in the life. Uh, are, do you have like a mafia channel or are you? No, I, I mean, I feel as though that people that once lived in organized crime and no longer lived that life and made positive changes to themselves, there's no better inspirational story than that. I mean, to not want to go back to that life and to create a new life for yourself in a positive way, to me, is a remarkable rebound. Well, I wouldn't argue with you, with you about that because, like I said, what, what Christ has done in my life is far beyond any of my wildest dreams. I, got. I would never think, and nobody in the back, nobody would ever think I'd be doing what I'm doing today if they knew me back then. So that's the other reason why we wrote the first book, The Witness, is people back home can't see what I'm doing now. People here that are with me today can't understand how I live back home. So I thought we would bring it together and share it with everybody that this is who I was, but this is who I am today. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, Robert, I think we, you know, I appreciate you, you know, everything that we spoke about today. I mean, we could, me and you could probably talk for another couple hours if we wanted to, based upon, you know, what we've been through and stuff like that. Um, but, um, you know, um, for those people out there that, you know, are struggling or for those people that, you know, are just starting to live a new life of sobriety or just, you know, finding, finding God or anything. Is there any inspiration uh, that you want to talk to people about? Um, any last, you know, things that you'd like to say on uh, the end of our episode? Yeah. Well, what I share most important, and, and I think this is for everybody, save people, unsafe people, uh, that you don't have to stay where you're at. You don't have to stay stuck in your situation, your circumstances. I share that it's never, never, never too late for a new beginning. But I also let people know that my new beginning started in Rikers Island jail cell, on my hands and knees, crying out to God for the hope that only I believe he could have changed my life the way it's changed today. And that's available for anybody. Absolutely. And, um, you know, I commend you for, you know, your work that you put in at your ministries and, um, you know, the life that you live now. Um, I, I have a lot of respect for you, Robert. Well, thank you so much. And once again, I want to say thank you for allowing me to share on your podcast uh, what God has done in my life and where I was today and where I am. I mean, where I was back then to where I am today. So. Absolutely. Well, um, guys, thanks for coming out and listening to, you know, this episode of Sober Sit Down. Uh, I'd like to appreciate, I'd like to reach out and uh, thank Robert once again. I appreciate him coming out uh, and I uh, hope you guys like this segment and um, please hit subscribe at the bottom of the page if you like this content and share with your friends.